and it would just be a good time. But uh, I did want to remind you just a few of those procedural things that are going to look different. Uh, as always, uh, if we get to the invitation time, that's something that the Lord's laid on your heart. Uh, please feel free. There's plenty of room around you. You can uh, pray there at your chair. I mean, you would like to talk to me. And then whenever we're dismissing, you just stay seated. And uh, I can come and get you afterwards. And we can go down to the office and uh, we can talk and whatever we need to do there. But uh, just be aware of those things as we try and take care of everybody. Uh, hang on, I got one more thing. I mean, this one has got to announce it. Uh, many of you have already been by the office this week and picked up Sunday school materials. The summer Sunday school material is in. You're like, well, we don't have Sunday school right now. I know, but a lot of you still like going through the Sunday school curriculum. So we have that in the office. If you haven't stopped by and picked yours up, please stop by during the week. If you want to hang out after we get done here today, I can take you down there when we get that taken care of. But it is in, and it's available uh, if you would like that. Yes, I don't need a microphone. Uh, uh, one of our local farmers has bestowed a ton of squash on us, and we also get stuff, you know, from the food bank, get stuff from Walmart. So I have some squash, and I've got more coming this week. So we brought the squash over here in the bags. Take it!
she wanted to see the Avengers, so we started from scratch and been watching through all of those again. And so we've been watching a lot of movies. But here's one thing that we've discovered in our house when it's time to watch a movie. The movie may say that it's a two-hour movie. It never takes us two hours to watch that movie. It's always pause and we answer some questions. Then you get away. Pause, you answer some more questions. The thing that we have discovered is my daughter has a lot of questions. And some of them I'm like, I don't know. I, I've never really thought why Dr. Strange's cape comes floating to me in my opinion. I don't know why it's that way. But she's full of questions. Now, can any of you relate? You ever watch a movie with somebody that you're like, I love you, but can you just listen for like five seconds? <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, I, I would just like to watch the movie. We, we get that. As we look around here lately, though, we've all got questions, don't we? This isn't just a child thing. It's not just in the movies. Thing. We've all got questions. As we look around in our world over the last few days, weeks, months, we've all got questions that we're asking. And I'm going to tell you, I don't have a whole lot of answers. I look around and I start asking questions like, why do we see such things as social injustice and societal unrest? Why, here in the year 2020, are we still dealing with this stuff? I can't tell you what the easy answer is. And then I ask things like, well, why do the actions of a few reflect so poorly on everybody else? You know, think about it. We see, we turn on our TVs and we see protests and rioting going on. And natural instinct. Lump them in together. Well, why are the actions of a few reflecting poorly on the others? Try the other side of that. Why are the actions of some officers reflect so poorly on everybody else? I'm asking these questions. I'm going to tell you, I don't come up with any easy answers on why that's the conclusion that we've reached. And then let's pretend another question. Why do I struggle with my own feelings and perceptions on this stuff? Why is it that when I think about it, I find myself getting defensive. Why is it when I think about it, I start trying to justify this or that? I struggle with that. We ask some hard questions. And then we look around and we see that we still have restrictions in place, guidelines in place. So apparently corona is alive and well and kicking even if we don't hear as much about it over the last week. And we go, Lord, don't we have enough on our plate? Why do we have to deal with sickness and afflictions all over the world? Because well, it's not just kids that have questions. We have questions, and lots of them. And here's what I want you to realize. Because if you're like me, as you ask those questions, as you ponder these things in your mind, how does it leave you feeling? Over the last several days, I've found myself feeling depressed, angry, hopeless, going is this ever going to get any better? Is anything ever going to look different, or is this how life is just going to be? And when we get to that, when we watch helplessness and hate and hurt and death seemingly touch every corner of our world, we're like, this preacher, this is just a bed of roses, isn't it? And folks, here's the conclusion I've come to. The reason that we see all this the reason that we have to answer such hard questions is because something happened a long time ago that broke our world. Something happened a long time ago that changed the course of history forever. Now, when we get to Genesis 3, we see what this event is. We're going to spend some time looking at it this morning. We just simply call it the fall. Adam and Eve there in the Garden of Eden, and sin is introduced. Sin enters the picture. And I'm going to tell you, it corrupted everything. Spoiler alert, you want to know why we see all the things that we're seeing right now? Whether it be riots and protests and racism and families and pandemics. You want to know why we see all that? One single event that we're just fixing to read about. The fall, sin entered the picture, and it corrupted everything completely. So Genesis 3, we're going to read the whole chapter. It's not a long chapter, so don't panic. But uh, we're going to pick up here in verse 1. 
It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Did God actually say you should not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate it. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves one cloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which had commanded you not to eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave to me with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Time to come. God is really accepted. That is what God The lady made me do it. It started way back when we started sloughing off blame. But here's Adam. God calls him on the carpet. What's his first reaction? Oh, he totally throws his wife under the bus. Just a few minutes earlier, he would have said, This is the apple of my eye, the gift of God in my life. And now then, she made it in. He, he, he blamed it on Eve. Verse 13 says, Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, God, you listen to the voice of your wife, and eaten of the tree, which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall break forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground. For out of you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made for Adam and for Eve, his wife, garments and skins, and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand, and take also the tree of life, and he live forever. Therefore the God sent him out of the garden to be, to work the ground which he has taken. He drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way. The tree of life. Now, when we read that story, we're like, oh, that's one of those chapters in scripture that it's just really not that exciting, is it? It's kind of depressing, it's kind of a downer. But I'm going to tell you, it's a chapter of scripture that is relevant always. Because if you ever have to ask the question, well, why do I see this? Why do I see that? Any bad thing that you come up with, guess what we need to trace that back to? Right here in Genesis chapter 3. When sin entered the picture. Now I want you to realize just how good Adam and Eve had it. Yeah. When we read the first couple chapters of Genesis. Starting with creation. God said. I want a relationship. I want to create something. And every day by day by day. What did he say after every day? It's good. It was good. God says. Man, I'm doing a good job. This is good work. But he gets to man. And what's he say? Oh, it was very good. I outdone myself in creating man. Everything was wonderful. He creates the perfect people. He puts them in the perfect place. This Eden. Now, when we say something is perfect, we 
we use a garden of Eden metaphor now because that's what it's come to be. Something that is absolutely awesome. Absolutely perfection. And this is where God put his prized creation in the Garden of Eden where they didn't have to worry about anything. Just like that, it was gone. When sin entered the picture, perfection left. When sin entered the picture, everything was corrupted. It changed the entire course of history. And it led to some pretty dire consequences. This morning, we're going to spend just a few minutes and we're going to kind of dive into this and see exactly what those consequences were. What is it that sin has corrupted? The first thing that we're going to look at this morning is that sin has corrupted the relationship between God and man. And we said that when God created, He said it's good. When He got to man, it's very good. Because see, when God created man, He said, I want something, someone that I can have fellowship with. With. I want someone that I can enjoy a relationship with. So being God Almighty, the creator of the universe, he said, it's not enough for me to have nature. It's not enough for me to have beasts in the field, birds in the air. He said, I need man. He said, I'm going to create him in my image. And he did. It's wonderful. If you read through there, every day was this close fellowship with God. They would be enjoying all that God had given them there in the Garden of Eden. But what happened every single day? God came down and walked with them and talked with them face to face, personally, there in the Garden of Eden. Can you just imagine how amazing that would be? To be able to experience your Creator physically sitting there in a chair next to you today. You say, well, preacher, we've got the assurance that God's there with you. I can talk to you anytime I want. I'm not denying that one bit. But to be able to reach out and hug him, to be able to feel him, put his arm around me and tell me that he loves me, how amazing must that have been for Adam and Eve to enjoy that kind of close-knit fellowship with the Father? It tells us that was normal for them. That was their everyday operating routine. That was what God had planned from the very beginning. That's the relationship that he wanted. But then Eve eats of the fruit. Gives them to Adam. He eats of the fruit. It says their eyes were open. All of a sudden, sin interfered. Sin changed God's plan. He changed. It changed how people interact with him. And so now that when God comes down and walk in the garden with him, what does it tell us that Adam and Eve did? It says they hid because they were afraid. I'm going to give you some little side note here. Anywhere in the first two chapters, can you see anything remotely hidden that Adam and Eve have ever been afraid of? No. They had never been afraid. They had never been ashamed. They had no reason to be. But when sin came in, it changed it up. All of a sudden, fear entered the picture. So, as we look around and we ask all these questions, fear is one of the things that we feel. Can I tell you where fear comes from? Mm -hmm. Sin. When sin in the picture, so did fear. So did shame. And so folks, we, we got to recognize it for what it is. But sin corrupted this relationship. It interfered with God's ideal. It says man became afraid. Man became ashamed. And he hid from God. And I would say we're still hiding. Oh, you may have been a Christian now for years and years. But there's times that you still feel fear and shame when you're in the presence of the Holy God. And you don't want to in this prayer. So we hide. We try and run, which is absolutely ridiculous. I find it humorous here. What's God asking when he walks in the garden? Says, Where are you? Yeah. Like God didn't know. Any of your kids ever play hide and seek? Not so well. <coughs> You know, they're hiding behind the chair and you see the top of their head and there's a leg sticking out. And they go, come find me. And what do you say? Well, where are you? Not that you don't know. You just play along. God knew exactly where Adam and Eve were. And he wanted Adam and Eve to be able to come out, to say, vocalize what it was that they had done. We're hiding because we're naked, afraid, ashamed. 
sin and all that. It interfered with everything. And that close relationship that they once had, now they're hiding from God. I want you to notice what the consequences were. God looked at Adam and said, You are the pinnacle of my creation. You are the apple of my eye. This is very good. And he gave them everything they would ever need. They didn't have to work for anything. It was just provided. Well, what happens after sin enters the picture? Garden of Eden? No. No longer is everything just to be provided for you. You've got to go out and the sweat of your brow earn a living. Every day is going to be a struggle for you now. There were eternal consequences to that. The biggest would be guess what happened with God? No longer did He come and walk and talk with Him in the cool of the day. No longer did they get to see Him face to face. No longer was He able to put His arm around them to draw them close. They're now separated for generations and generations and generations. That's what people live with. Knowing that there was a separation from God, God has given them ways that they can draw close, but they can never enjoy that fellowship that he had originally. We look forward, and even when we get to the cross, God says, I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you the pardon for sin. But even now, I've enjoyed that fellowship with God. I'm fettered. Access to him. We still look forward to the day when I get to see him face to face. I was saying about it. I can only imagine the day when I get to look upon his face. I can only imagine what that's going to be like when I get to fall down in his feet. This, this is how it's supposed to be in all of them. And sin and intervention, it corrupted the relationship between God and man. No longer did I have that. I was separated from God. My natural state is to be separated. All because of sin. And there's another thing that sin corrupted. And that is that sin corrupted the bond between mankind. Not only did it separate me from my loving Creator, but it damaged how I interact with my fellow man. And we see this played out in a lot of ways, even right here in this passage. Uh, one of the first ones that we see is that it ruined the harmony of the marital relationship. Look at verse 16. What does it say when God talks to Eve? It says, and he told her, said, uh, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Husbands, wives, how do you cross words with me? <laughs> no, I don't worry. We're that much time for counsel today. Yeah, we've been there. Husbands, wives, you ever had a difference of opinion where you weren't all on the same page? Yeah, been there. Guess what? Started right here. Prior to sin entering the picture, there was complete marital harmony. Look how verse or chapter 2 begins. It's talking about God sending Eve to Adam. It's, you hear a lot of ways. It says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and brother and hold fast his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Folks, prior to this instance and the fall, there was no discord in the marital relationship. There was no disharmony. They got along. They were equals. They thought alike. They wanted the same things. But because of sin, the consequence was now that you're both going to pursue your own agendas. You're both going to want different things. And try as you may, there's still going to be conflict. Folks, the corruption of sin messed up that part. The harmony that man and wife had enjoyed before that was now forever lost. He said, well, we're working on it. Good. I hope you continue to work on it. Guess what Adam and Eve did not have to do? They didn't have to work on it before this. It was just their natural state to live in harmony with one another. But now, shattered. We also see this uh, in, the, in the family. At the bond between mankind and Satan, when we look at the family, fast forward one more chapter to chapter four. And what's that? If you got headings in your Bible, what's it say? Cain and Abel. Just 
Cain and Abel. And we go, oh yeah, that story. You remember that one, don't you? You got two brothers. One of them uh, does one thing, one of them does another. They both bring their offerings. One of them is accepted, the other one isn't. One of them gets angry and has a loose heart. Goes and kills his brother. Whew, that escalated quickly. We went from one decision introducing sin to the world to, I'm going to kill my brother because I'm mad at him. Folks, you may not have ever killed anybody if you have. We probably really do need to talk about it. So just stay seated here in the invitation. You may not have ever even entertained that kind of thought. Have you ever been mad at a family member? Have you ever been so hurt by a family member that you say, we're done? Where did that start? Right here, chapter 3. The sin corrupted the bond between family members. I always wonder, what would it have been like for Adam and Eve when he tells Eve that your, your pain is going to be increased in childbearing? Apparently, all along it was the plan for Eve to have children and multiply on the earth. That was just how it was supposed to be. So, if sin had never entered the picture, how would Cain and Abel have gotten involved? How would it have all worked out? Would they all just live there in the garden? Would God have kept adding more and more to it? Just there. Life is wonderful. 
y axis. That says, I messed up. I told you specifically not to do this. You could have done anything. I gave you free reign. I just gave you one thing. I told you not to do it. You did it anyway. So here's the consequence. You have to leave. You can't stay here in the Garden of Eden. You can't stay here where everything is perfect anymore. You can't stay here where everything will be provided for you. You have to leave. And what we see from this point on is that no longer did nature make Instead, nature itself would fight against him from here on out. Things like physical toil. That means that he removes the things that 
in me that don't look like him, that don't glorify him. He's constantly smoothing off those rough edges to make me more and more like him. Folks, here's what I want us to understand today. Because of the blood of Jesus, I can be better. It's possible. I don't get to throw my hands up and go, this is just the way it is. Because of the blood of Jesus, because he has come in and covered my sin and cleansed me, I can be better. Folks, here's what we've got to understand. It's only when I relent to his shaping, though, that I will be better. It's available to all of us. It's available to come in and be cleansed. But even when I'm cleansed at my core, I still got a sin nature. Until I let Jesus come in every single day, shape me in his image, make me more and more like him, I will never be any different. I'll still show signs of the same wickedness that we saw there in Genesis chapter 6. I've got to let him shape me. When that happens, I will be better. Today, we can question all the things that are going on around us. If we really want to see it, start to let the blood of Jesus change us. Now and forever. So I ask you this morning, have you been cleansed by the blood? If not, that's got to be the starting point. You can commit to working harder. You can commit to doing all kinds of things. But if you've never been cleansed by the blood, that's when we got to start. That's the only way to effectively deal with sin. Amen. But many of you are saying, no, I, I can tell you today, I can tell you where it was at. I can tell you all about when I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. Let me ask you this thing. Are you fighting him today? As he seeks to make you over into his image, are you fighting? Or are you letting him have his way? Folks, my prayer for myself and for all of you is that not only are we covered by the blood, but we let that blood continue to shape us and mold us to where every single day I look more and more like Him. The things that come out of my mouth, the thoughts that enter my head, look more and more like Him. And He's glorified by what I do. Questions are going to come. Folks, we have hope that we know He is found in Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning. When we look all around us, when we see things that maybe we never thought we would see in our lifetime, or maybe we're shocked that they're still around. But God, we know that the things that bring fear, the things that bring shame, which means that they're not from you. Rather, because of one decision that happened so long ago. Lord, when sin entered the picture and corrupted everything that you had hoped for and worked towards. Now we know you were not powerless. Now we know that even in that moment you had a solution. God, you were willing to give of yourself to redeem us. That's what we could be better. We would be better. God, ultimately, we would enjoy the relationship that you created for the first place. So, Father, I ask right now that as we go into this time, so as the Lord, you just look at our hearts and speak to us. God, I pray if there's anybody here, anybody who's watching, Lord, they've never given their life to you. Lord, they've never let the blood of your Son come cleanse them completely. Lord, today would be that day. Lord, today would be the day to quit trying to do it on their own and they just trust you. Lord, I pray that you'd also speak to me and warn of us who say, we know that we've given our lives to you, but we still fight you every day for control. We fight. You shape us in your image. And God, because of that, sometimes our attitudes don't reflect very well on you. The things that come out of our mouth don't reflect well on you. God, I pray today that you break our hearts and he and bring us through the feet and relent to your mercy and relent to your shame. I just ask right now as we go into this time, for you just have your will and your way in each and every day. In Jesus' name.
So not only can I depend on him, but I need to carry myself in a way that he'd be proud of. Because he is with me every single second of the day. Because my prayer is that as I'm aware of that, I start looking more like him. I hope that you do too. As we go into this week, let God shape you and mold you. Yes, sin is corrupted completely. Praise God, sin is not the end. God overcame it. And we can too. All right, was there anything before we dismiss this morning? All right, I'm going to ask. Oh, take squash. Take squash. Take squash. So, grab some of that on your way out. Uh, and hopefully, uh, I'm partial to fry it up. You can cook it how you want.